My name is John LaBelle, and this is an introduction to a course on non-Western architecture that I am giving at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York in fall 2014. So, non-Western. Does anybody know what we're looking at there? It's a Buddhist stupa. A stupa. So the Buddhists have a reliquary mound. There's nothing in there. Except it's a little bit gross, but anybody know what a reliquary is? It's a piece of a dead saint. So when a saint dies, exactly the same in Christianity and in Buddhism, they're cremated, cut up, and then the pieces are put in you know, like a glass jar. They're at various holy places. Does anybody know what they have at Chartres Cathedral? Mary's robe. So anyway, at, at, at religious sites, there's something of special religious power, and being, being there will enrich you. But we'll talk about that when we get to Buddhism. Just as support for the definition I gave you, Mies van der Rohe says, architecture is the real battleground of the spirit. Architecture depends on its time. It is the crystallization of its time's inner structure, the slow unfolding of its form. So I take that seriously, and then I try to see how, you know, how do we see that? When we look at a Gothic cathedral, when we look at a Buddhist stupa, when we look at a Mayan pyramid. Franklin Wright says almost the same thing. A great architect must be a great poet. He must be a great interpreter of his time, his day, his age. It's pretty much the same thing. So let's take these guys seriously and try to work from that approach. So what I'm going to reject is a materialist interpretation of culture. And uh, that's the Landis approach. It's also in a big bestseller. It's a figure who's now a major figure in the world of ideas. Jared Diamond. Cultures are materially based and I say, yes, obviously, a culture cannot do what it cannot do. In other words, if they don't have steel, they don't have steel. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff they're not going to do because they don't have steel. So, but that doesn't tell you enough. And we'll make the point when we get to the Mayans, the Mayans are, and we'll eventually we'll theoretically understand this, the Mayans are exact parallels to the Egyptians. Brother-sister marriage, mummification, pyramids, multiple layers of heavens and hells, rich complexity of deities. The Egyptians had bronze. The Mayans didn't even have the wheel. They had copper, which you can find in a stream bed. You don't need any metallurgical capability to work with copper. They did not have bronze. They didn't even have the wheel. They didn't have any draft animals. They didn't have horses. On a symbolic level, the cultures are very similar. On material levels, they're like in two different universes. But the Mayans did not let their lack of technological sophistication keep them from developing a culture that was the exact same symbolic culture as the Egyptian. Now, Diamond and Delanda will dance around to explain why, but when we get to China, we're going to see that in 1430, Admiral He set out with 300 ships, 90 giant treasure ships, each larger than a football field, each 15 times the tonnage of Columbus's ships, triple hull with farms on them and farm animals. Cortez set out with 12 ships, six horses, four cannons, and 400 men, and conquered the Aztec Empire. The West conquered the world not due to its technological superiority. Something else going on. So the key differences between cultures are their suprapsychology. So culture has a psychology the same as a person does. And in understanding that psychology, you'll understand the culture. If we see these very different religious edifices, why are they so different? 
Catholicism, Japanese Shintoism, Buddhism, Islam. These buildings are different because they're reflective of these different cultures. And even within a religion, if we know the history of St. Peter's, this is Michelangelo's St. Peter's. This got added on later. The artists of the Renaissance liked the central, central plan church with the dome in the middle. But whoever's under the dome has access to God. In Catholicism, you do not have access to God. You get God through the institution of the church. So the church eventually couldn't stand it anymore, put on the nave, you're here, the priest is here. You're not there, you're here. And so this architecture is a manifestation of the belief system of that religion. In Islam, everybody is equal under God. There is no pope. There is no hierarchy. Now, there can be respected teachers, there can be political leaders, but when you go on the Hajj, everybody wears the right white robe, everybody's equal. And so the architecture is one that makes everybody the same. So why are we looking at non-Western cultures? Well, our West, Western culture is only one of many cultures throughout history. I'm gonna try to say, avoid saying our, when I talk about Western culture. Talk about those people. <laughs> Western culture is not a final stage of world cultural development. Our Western culture is not stable and is perhaps on the verge of major transformation. And awareness of other cultures provides a basis for understanding Western culture and how it might change. So rather than take any of our cultures today as a given, we want to understand the cultural dynamics and how they can and most probably will change. So begin by looking at uh, briefly cultural theory, then we'll go through a survey, Paleolithic, well, primitive, pre-Columbian, India, Buddhism, China, Japan, Islam, the West, and then back again at the theory to wrap up. Now, we'll talk about this more at the end, but we're gonna use an approach of a figure named Oswald Spengler. And I was going to bring his book to show you, but I can't find it. My office is totally disorganized. But Spengler rejects a linear approach to history. We'll go into this in some detail. Primitive, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greek and Roman, Middle Ages, Renaissance, Modernism. What's wrong with that? It's Eurocentric. Where's China? Where's Japan? Where's India? Where are the Mayans? And then what we tend to do is we look at these other cultures when they intersect with the West. Oh, so there's the Crusades, Islam, and oh, the West encounters Islam, and that influences the Renaissance. And then uh, the Europeans in the 15th, 1600s encountered the Americas, gold comes back to Spain, Americans, the Europeans move to the Americas, and so there's an interaction with the North and South America. And then in the 1700s, India becomes part of the British Empire. India has a big influence on Britain. There are major influences of Indian philosophy on European philosophy. But that, again, is looking at these cultures in terms of how they relate to the West. We're going to look at them each independently. So these are... Spengler's cultures, and we're going to look at China, Confucian, Taoist, which includes Japan. We're going to look at Indian, we're going to look at Aztec, Mayan, and we'll look at Magian, Arabian. And you're familiar with Western through your other courses. And Mesopotamia is not that interesting architecturally. If you're studying culture, it's very important for what reason? apart from art and architecture. What's important about Mesopotamia? It's the origins of the biblical traditions. So the whole you know, biblical tradition, which we're not interested in because we're studying architecture, 
but would, you, if you were studying other subjects, you would focus on that. Now, in addition to each of these cultures being an independent entity in its own right, each culture goes through a development, which can be seen as, by analogy, to the seasons or to an organism. So a culture goes through a youth, a maturity, an old age, and a death. Depending on how you feel about the West, Western culture begins around 1000 AD. A culture lasts about 1000 years. Do the math. Now, at that point, a culture doesn't just necessarily fall over, but it goes into what Spengler calls a civilization stage in which it, it's interested in money and engineering. No more interest in art. There aren't going to be any more Mozarts or Beethovens. That's all. There's entertainment, but there isn't any music. And I'm not going to go into this because we'll do this next week, but here we look at five Eurasian cultures and see them in terms of their inherent worldview, and then the mythological story uh, that underlies them. And again, I'm going to skip this slide because we'll, we'll spend some time on it next week. So real quick, uh, what we're going to do over the next six weeks, or after the next week, we'll start Paleolithic. And here we are, in terms of human development, what does 300,000 BCE suggest? What are we as a species? Homo sapiens. When does Homo sapiens emerge? Around 100,000 BC. So these are pre-hominid ancestors. So many of our ancestors spread out of Africa numerous times. And then when Homo sapiens came out, they killed all the others. Neanderthals lasted until 30,000 BC. But here we have a shelter, a hearth, Creatures had fire. And here we are at the slope roof, the hearth. So this is lays down an archetypal image, which is in our minds right through postmodernism. There's Venturi's mother's house. The spiritual discipline of Paleolithic era is shamanism. There's shamans to this day among hunter gatherers. Shaman is an independent agent. A priest is ordained by an institution. A shaman is a freelancer. And we'll talk about this in two weeks. On this shamanism, here we see it uh, 30,000 BC in Lascaux. And here we see it in the 1700s in Siberia. You can take shaman workshops today in New York. Neolithic period is identified by small-scale agriculture. And then the crafts, you see woodworking, ceramics, metallurgy, woven cloth. And once you have gardening, you've got to be there when the crop comes in, so you get settled villages. Some of the Neolithic structures, Blue Grange Passage Mound. So we have this large mound, you come in, we have a corbelled, cruciform passageway. This is the New Range Passage Map, Nave, Transept, Apse. Here's 4,000 years later, Chartres, Nave, Transept, Apse. So we see these archetypes getting laid down and then played out. Here's the Nave of New Grange, the Nave of Chartres. Here's the rose window of Chartres, here's the light box. 4,000 years old. Just so we can hit Africa, we'll look very briefly at the Dogon. The, the Dogon is the favorite tribal peoples of architects. They're studied by an important modern architect named Aldo Van Eyck. Among other things, we see differentiation of building types. So here's a house, this is a granary. And then anthropomorphic, it's like a little person. Then we do pre Columbian. Teotihuacan, Mayan, Aztec, and Inca. Mayans the most interesting. Mayans are like the Greeks. The Aztecs are like the Romans. And this is uh, a Castillo um, Mayan pyramid. 
minds have a dying and resurrecting God? How many days was Christ in the underworld before he resurrected? What happened when he was there? We don't know. Um, the previous pope was speaking about that two years ago and said, we have no idea. <laughs> Quaxacoldo, we know everything that happened. The Mayans are much more interested in the unconscious than the uh, Christians are. So this is his dying and resurrecting. This is the same sculpture. Here's the back. Here's him as a death figure. Here's a life figure. Quaxacoldo is a dying and resurrecting God, born of a virgin and associated with a cross. Sound familiar? Every religion has one. So we see these archetypes play out. Indian Buddhism. So the Indian temple is a three-dimensional mandala. A mandala is a diagram of the structure of the universe and the structure of the mind, and it is a tool for putting the mind in harmony with the universe. And that's, that's what a Hindu temple is. A Hindu temple is a three-dimensional universe. I don't have a Hindu temple here. Here it is in plain. But here's a Buddhist stupa. Buddhism evolves out of Hinduism, sort of the way Christianity evolves out of uh, Judaism. So Buddhism is a universalization of Hinduism in a way that Christianity is a universalization. So this is a Buddhist stupa, stepped pyramid, stairs on four sides, temple on top. We look at China and Japan, and the Chinese value of being in harmony with nature. So here is a Western person. Nature is there, but dominated by the human being. There are people in here. We can hardly find them. They are blended with, not differentiated out of, nature. This is Isi Shrine in Japan. Uh, key thing about this, and um, I didn't include that image, I should have, but it's rebuilt every 20 years. So this is built out of wood. They, the wood is not finished or varnished so that it decays, and right next door they build another one, and they tear this one down, and they build one there. That's been going on for 2,000 years. Islamic architecture. Islam is anti-iconographic. Not allowed to make images. We're going to walk. And so we get this incredible geometries. Now, when we talk about Islam, we'll talk about post-colonialism and uh, scholarship about the relationship between West and other culture. Specifically, the relationship between the West and Middle East is addressed in Edward Said's book, Orientalism. So we'll talk about that. So post-colonialism is the broader category of study of the West to the other. And Orientalism is within that category, specifically deals with the West and the Middle East. We'll look at the West stand in the nave of a Gothic cathedral. Right away, the descendants of these people are going to circle the globe, you can see it right there, and go into space. The whole thing is laid down by 1200 and what this culture is going to do. That's what a building does. A culture begins by laying down its epic poem and its temple form. The epic poem describes the moral parameters of the culture, and the temple form describes the relationship to space and time of the culture. Temple form for the Greeks is the Greek temple, for the Egyptians is the Egyptian pyramid, and the Egyptian temples, for Islam the mosque, for Buddhism the stupa, for Hinduism the Hindu temple. So with the West, we have the emergence of an individual, and this is the place of the individual. So Palladio's Villa Rotunda gives us the center of an XYZ axis, 
where the individual stands surveying out east, west, north, south, right, left, front, back, and, and vertical. So the world is known and measured from the individual.